My father was a tireless advocate for the law. He was a criminal prosecutor. Some say ruthless, others say righteous. Yeah, I'm cut from the same cloth. I can't really remember who I was before I became a cop. It's my job to make bad things happen to bad people. I think it was somebody who Linda knew and trusted. It's terrifying. Something is wrong, and you don't know what. I knew when she wasn't found, she was murdered. wasn't easily intimidated. It doesn't make any sense that it could have been somebody like her. But it was. I was called and told that there had been some remains found. When the police arrived, they just said, well, the, the identification had been made, and yes, it was your sister. It was an awful day. I don't know whether she was dead quickly or easily. We pursue our lives because we have to. I would like to know what took place back then. And of course, I want to know why it happened. We've all grown older. Uh, Linda didn't have the chance to grow older. How did you feel, Joan, to hear that she'd gone missing? Terribly worried. The police were suggesting the person shows up a day or two later and there's been some misunderstanding. When did the police start taking this seriously as suspicious? I'd say it was two days before the police really get, get started to show some degree of considerable concern. I don't like it when a case like this goes this long unsolved. In my opinion, this case is very solvable. We want an answer. We really want an answer. The idea is we get justice for Linda. That's what this is about. So with your blessing, we would like to do that. You certainly have mine. <laughs> and mine. <laughs> Linda White's case is personally important to me for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's a London case. Number two, it's a Western case. My hometown, my university. My mission at this point, my moral imperative, my professional obligation, is to throw every possible resource I can muster at this case. I've been a cop and a professor of criminology for years, and I've used that experience to assemble a squad of civilian subject matter experts. They must approach each case completely unbiased, to not box themselves into conventional thinking, to bring fresh eyes and new technologies to the table. Their job, and mine, to investigate the coldest of cold cases, the murders that time forgot. Next case, Linda White. Original file number, 1968 this is 1968. This is the oldest case that you will have to examine. The facts are as follows. November 13th, 1968, Linda White, age 19, student at the University of Western Ontario, writes a French midterm. 
She asked some friends to go out after the exam. They declined. She says she's going to go home. She's last seen leaving that exam on her way home. And in fact, fails to turn up over the next 24 hours, at which point her roommate gets worried, calls the police. Police insist, in spite of people's worry, she'll probably be back in a couple days. It's speculated that Linda, stressed out over midterms, had a first year freshman meltdown and probably ran away. This case was cold before it even started. Her family starts doing some legwork themselves. They refuse to accept the theory that she would have run away. She had no cause, no reason to run away whatsoever. Days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months. Worry begins to mount. Her family undertook much of the early investigation on their own, following up with eyewitness sightings suggesting that she was still alive. A telephone call on May 9th, 1973, almost a full five years after Linda went missing, dashed those hopes. Skeletonized remains over 100 kilometers from where Linda was last seen at that exam were found. Dental records confirm the skeleton in the woods, buried beneath some leaves and brush, was that of Linda White. The clothes were found a considerable distance away near the town of Tilsonburg. No jewelry found on or near the body, and in fact, never recovered. That includes the Medic Alert bracelet Linda always wore on her right wrist. Not only was the Medic Alert bracelet not found, but in fact, the whole arm was missing. So let's start with some questions. Do we have a cause of death at all? There is no cause of death that was ever established. But we do know the police immediately ruled it a homicide, in part because She'd been gone for so long, and also because no clothing was found on or near the body. Can you tell me more about how her body was found? The body was found supine, no real burial. Only the arm was missing? That's right. And was there any evidence of animal activity? As you and I are going to deduce whether or not part of the skeleton was taken away by animals. If not, then we're looking at a completely different scenario. All right, I'm gonna go around the table and I wanna hear first action items. Renee? I'm interested in where her body was found and the state of her skeleton, and if there's anything more we can do with that data today. An archeological assessment of the dump site itself. Good. Linda's last seen here in London. Fast forward nearly five years, her remains show up over 100 kilometers from where she was last seen. Talking about someone driving with Linda's body on board a vehicle, whether alive or dead, for a significant distance. One month earlier, 40 kilometers west of where her body was found, her clothing is found. I've never seen anything like this. So Peter, I need you to conduct a geographic profile overlaying these data points onto other potentially related cases. If there are other cases committed by this same offender, the map will show it. I'm honest. The most interesting fact about this case is the wide geographic extent of where Linda was last seen and where her skeletal remains were discovered. Whoever did this put this huge distance between London and Linda's remains, and I want to know why. Dania, as the media strategist, I need you to collect the preliminary data. Get that data to Peter so he can start populating our map of potentially related cases. Bear in mind the social context of this crime. London in 1968 was a cesspool polluted with sexual deviance. My instincts tell me whoever did this is still around. Let's thaw this case out. Let's go. They uh, ruled this dis disappearance as a runaway. Who knows, in those initial few hours, uh, what kind of a head start the perpetrator got. The fact that 45 years have gone by since Linda's murder is daunting, but there are so many interesting points to touch on. I'm really just eager to dig into the facts. This case is fraught with challenges. We have no eyewitnesses, no forensic evidence. We have a skeleton in the middle of the woods. 45 years have now passed since the murder of Linda White. Her case is by far the most challenging that this squad of civilians has faced. 
Five years after her disappearance, Linda's skeleton was discovered over 100 kilometers from where Linda was last seen. Her right arm was missing. All of her clothes were missing. No cause of death could ever be established. I've tasked Peter with tracking down where Linda's body was dumped. Linda's remains were found in a wooded area. The task at hand is for me to find out who owns it, get permission from them to set up a perimeter and conduct a crime scene investigation. Comparing historical aerial photographs with contemporary satellite imagery, I'm very sure that this is the place. Hi there. I was just wondering if you're the landowner of that stand of trees right over there. Yes, we are. If we can apply contemporary forensic analysis, then we may find the clues that help solve the murder of Linda White. In 1973, her skeleton was found right in that stand of trees. I'd like to ask your permission to access the site where Linda was found, because my team and I would like to set up a forensic investigation. No problem. OK, so how do we actually access the place? You could access it from the, the dirt road if you go out the laneway and turn left. It's very hard to see. I actually wasn't aware of that road until we lived here, even when I was younger and living in the area. You would have to know that that road was there. If someone who's local to the area had no idea this lane even existed, then there's no way a killer would have transported a body here and chosen it as a dump site. They would have had to have prior knowledge of the location in order to find it in the first place. I'm at the London Library today to gather information to start working on our geographic profile. I've tasked Peter and Daniel with doing deep archival research into killers, including sexual murderers and kidnappers who were active in the area in the 1960s and on to the 1970s. I need them to analyze and account for any and all commonalities. Linda White was killed 45 years ago. And as a result, there's no quick or easy way to do this. We just need to draw on our traditional methods of, of searching the archives, and just go at it till we find as much as we can. In and around London at the time, Christian McGee. Okay. He was responsible for killing um, a girl in 1974, another one in 1975, another one in 1976. He could have been around when Linda was murdered. He's a serial killer. I also found a sexually motivated serial killer who was ultimately found not guilty by reason of insanity. Another one? Yeah, <laughs> Russell Johnson. He killed three women at least all in their early 20s in Guelph and London. What I'm looking at here is comparative analysis, if you will. Linda White's murder on a map. We then continue to collect as much data as we can about other comparable murders and map those on top of Linda's murder and see if any patterns arise. And if these other homicides reinforce Linda's pattern, then we may have something. Checking in on Renee's progress with a series of photographs I've given to her that depict the state and position of Linda's skeleton and the burial environment where Linda's skeleton was found. She's excavated numerous bodies in various stages of decomposition, including fully skeletonized remains like Linda's. Do you have some sense of what we might be dealing with here in terms of burial activity? I don't think that there was so much of a, a shallow grave as much as the remains were placed on the surface. One of the first things that struck me was the body position. I've never seen a skeleton laid out this way, either in a forensic setting or archeologically. To be splayed with all the limbs pointing in different directions is very strange. This body's been posed. If you were gonna just dump a body and cover it in brush, you would not take the time to pose it like this. You can see that here we have the, the left arm and the right arm is missing. It does seem strange to me as well that only the arm would be missing. 
When I first saw the photographs of Linda's remains, despite their poor quality, there were a few things that struck me as unusual. I wasn't able to explain the fact that her arm was missing from the shoulder joint down. That was inconsistent with anything I'd ever seen or heard of in the past. Even in cases where remains are properly buried, if they're not deep enough, animal scavengers will dig to find the source of the smell of decomposition and scatter remains from within a grave. So for something left on the surface to be so intact, with the exception of the right arm, it just doesn't speak to me of a natural process. It seems as though this is due to deliberate human activity on the part of the perpetrator. It's been staged with no evidence of clothing, other evidence, or artifacts. So there was very specific placement of Linda's body at this scene for reasons that we still don't know. Was there a stretch of time where she was still alive between when she went missing and the five years later when she was discovered? It'll be really important to determine just how long she's been there because that will speak to who we should be looking at as suspects. Gather your tools, your equipment, and uh, we're gonna have to go out and do some field work. The missing arm from Linda's skeleton is very troubling. It suggests it was something very deliberate, something very calculated, something very sadistic. The question we need to uncover and do so quickly is what kind of person would do this and why? I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Linda White disappeared in 1968, at age 19. Her skeleton was then discovered five years later. Now, more than four decades on, the squad and I are tasked with starting over. Renee has discovered indicators that Linda's missing arm may have been taken by her killer. This disturbing revelation, combined with the long distances traveled by the murderer, are very specific crime signatures. Peter has come up with the names of two confirmed serial killers who were active in the area at the time and I'm very curious to see if they have some bearing on Linda's case. So Peter, Dania, your geographic profile. He found two convicted serial killer rapists that might have been in the area at the time of Linda's murder. Okay. One being Russell Johnson, the other one being Christian McGee. I know these cases inside and out. In the case of Linda White, we're dealing with someone who is highly mobile. Johnson and McGee killed victims in their own homes. There's no concealment, no body placement, no deposition or burial, shallow or otherwise. We're dealing with a much different type of offender. By all accounts, we can exclude both Johnson and McGee in this case. Let's meet again in a couple days. coming up just here where that line of trees takes off and if you turned up here in the night you wouldn't be able to see your hand in front of your face out here the killer drove this path sometime before november 1968 there's no way you would just instinctively turn up this path and hope for the best in the night with a body on board you would have to be pretty sure that no one else was up here This gravesite archaeological excavation will help us determine whether Linda was actually killed here or killed elsewhere, deposited elsewhere, and then moved here as sort of the final resting place. Lying beneath this brush, alone, but in a location the killer could recognize and return back to. Nobody knew where to find her. I mean, that to me is what I'm thinking about. So what we need to do is do a systematic search of this area. We're looking specifically for Linda's medical alert bracelet or any evidence of animal activity. Peter, in your search lane just up ahead, there seems to be a bone lying parallel to that tree. Can you tell yeah, what it's from? It's definitely not human. You can see here these kind of scalloped edges. That's all the kind of evidence of rodent gnawing. There's no evidence of kind of a carnivore activity. 
Alright, let's bag it. Renee, got a hit. Now, this is pretty much centered on where we think Linda's body was found. So, best case scenario, we find this bracelet. Mm -hmm. What's that going to tell us about the case? One of the potential explanations why her arm was missing was because of that medical alert bracelet and perhaps its ability to identify her. But if it's actually here, then why take the arm without that associated artifact? Exactly. This might be There we go. It's too bad. Yeah. It's hoping for more. The main piece of information we're trying to get from the soil is the level of acidity. That would have affected how quickly Linda's body would have decomposed in this environment. It may also provide us some hints as to whether Linda's body was here the entire time or whether it was moved from another location. This killer knew that this spot existed. This is a premeditated dump site. This is remarkable in terms of crime scene behavior. We're dealing with a very specific type of killer. A sadistic, highly organized, and likely psychopathic killer. I've tasked Antonella with meeting a global expert on ritualistic crimes to gain insight into what kind of killer would take Linda's arm and why. Knowing this will help narrow down our investigation by creating a psychological profile of the killer. I also want to verify our suspicions that Linda was not at the burial site for the full five years she was missing. I'd like to start off by telling you that it's almost certain Linda White's arm was taken by a person. What would that mean? It's definitely a big sign. It's not a typical murder. If somebody's going to hide the identity of the person, they'll cut off the hands or the head or pull the teeth out so that you can't do dental records or you can't do fingerprints. So if it's just one arm, it's not about that. It definitely, in this person's mind, has specific meaning and it probably makes them either feel good or powerful or sexually excites them. Linda's body was found concealed by fallen branches. There was no grave dug. It would probably indicate that it was a dump site or that she may have been somewhere else for a while. Linda's body was found splayed. Positioning the body is one of the common signs of a ritualistic crime. This is really sick. This is somebody who's very disturbed, likely somebody who's killed before and is probably going to kill again. It's been over 45 years, but there's no doubt in my mind that if this person is still alive, they're very much a threat. They may still be hunting, looking for victims. The squad of civilians, subject matter experts, and I are examining with fresh eyes the case of 19-year-old Linda White, who vanished in 1968. Her fully skeletonized remains were then found five years later in a shallow grave. campus where Linda wrote a French exam the night she disappeared. Her last verified whereabouts. Danny was able to find a person who'd been posting online about Linda. As it turns out, this poster's roommate was the last person to actually see Linda White alive. It's a very interesting development and at an interesting time. So this door is the general vicinity where Linda White was last seen, around 8.15, the night of the exam. We now know that, in fact, this person drove her somewhere the night she disappeared. She didn't just vanish in thin air. In further conversation with this anonymous web poster and his roommate, the location that they regularly drove Linda to, and they assumed was her home, was in fact not her home at all. It's not corroborated yet, which is in part why we're going there. She was last seen walking by this building. Yeah. 
So this is the spot, based on their account, she was dropped off on this corner adjacent this building routinely. And they assume she lived there. Well, that's, right here. The, that's the question. Was she going somewhere else on this street? Your focus now is who lives in this building and along this street. I'll leave it to you. I'll okay. check back later. OK. Is there any connection, any point in common between someone along this road and Linda White at the time of her disappearance? One of the key objectives at this point is the data analysis. We need to figure out how we can plot Linda White's murder in the context of what else was going on in the area at the time. Something I found is what I think is a connection. Okay. These are all murders of young women spanning from 1966 to 1970 in the London area. We have Linda White and we have Soraya O'Connell, who was 15 years old. These cases are still unsolved. I found another one. Mm -hmm. 1960 sex murder of 20 year old. He admitted smothering her to death, raping her, and leaving her partially clad body in a bush lot. Bush lot? Yeah. Similar to Linda White being left in a wood lot. And this was just north of. That yeah, is yeah. not that far away from London. You draw a line from London through. And you get to where Linda White was dumped. So. What's this guy's name? David. We have a connection between unsolved murder cases in the 1960s and 1970s. White and O'Connell, and one victim whose killer has been convicted. The fact that we have a conviction, the fact that records will exist for this case, that's our starting point to begin to bootstrap our way towards connecting it to other cases, such as Linda's. I'm here at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology to meet with Dr. Helen LeBlanc, who's a world-renowned entomologist, primarily to determine what kind of timeline we're looking at to go from Linda's body when it was left there to the full skeletonization. I'm also hoping she can tell me whether Linda's arm is missing as a result of animal scavenging or deliberate human activity. These are some of those photographs that I had sent you from when Linda's body was first recovered by police. There were a number of trees and branches pulled on top of the body to conceal it. Would that be sufficient to prevent access by animals? Absolutely not. My analysis to date suggests that Linda's remains were not at the recovery site for the full five years. What did these photographs suggest to you about how long Linda's remains were at the site? If you get an environment that's cool and damp, Canada is not a dry, arid environment. And you'll see a lot of this white, cheesy, or waxy stuff um, on the body. And that's adipose here. And the shallow burial is great for the formation of adipose here. And so you expect to see some adipose here formation in a shallow burial like this. We know there was no adipose here on Linda's skeleton, but given the shallow grave and the moist soil conditions, there should have been. It seems highly unlikely that her body could have been at the recovery site for the full five years. One more method we can use to test this hypothesis is to test the pH balance of the soil that we collected at the burial site. So a pH of five, is that terribly significant? It would have been an optimal condition for atmosphere to form. The pH level confirms that Linda's body was not at the recovery site for the full five years. The question is, where was she? In the case of Linda White, the squad of civilian specialists and I have discovered information never before known in this 45-year-old mystery. The body being moved to the burial site years after she was last seen. A new lead that Linda was not last seen at the school, but was in fact dropped off in a residential neighborhood by a classmate sometime after the exam. Right now I'm on Western Road. I'm here because this is where Linda had been dropped off. That was the last place she was seen alive by anyone that we know. Hopefully someone's still around that was here at that time. Connect that to Linda, figure out why she was coming here. Is there anyone like over 60 living that you would no, know of? All students? Yeah. I'm trying to find 
people that lived right along here in 1968. Uh, being so close to the main campus, it's all young people now, and it would have been all young people then. Most renters wouldn't be here for any more than four years at the most. Hopefully, someone's still around that was here at that time. Connect that to Linda. Figure out why she was coming here. Peter, I've been waiting with great anticipation to see what you've come up with in terms of the other cases. On the smart board here, we have a map of 22 cases that we've narrowed down to three cases that we believe bear a striking resemblance to the murder of Linda White. OK, case number one. Starting with a case from 2012, we come across an attempted kidnapping, a stranger on stranger attack committed by an 80 plus year old assailant. In 2012, he's in his 80s. Right which would have put him into his mid-30s uh, back when Linda was killed. That's uh, completely consistent with serial killer ages. Certainly within the range. He traveled with his intended victim for some time prior to her escape. He was abducting and hunting along a rural road. What else makes this case relevant? There were some similarities to the White case, firstly being the fact that he was taking her towards a wood lot. And he said, you're very pretty. I want to keep you for a long time. The victim testified that the man kept slowing down and looking for some trail off the road. That's all we know at this moment. What's your second case? This is the case with the second longest distance between place last seen and body discovered. Soraya's body was discovered about four years after she disappeared in 1970. The body was not fully buried. It was covered up by a piece of bark from a nearby tree. And our third case is focused on a 20-year-old female victim from the 1960s murdered and dumped on the outskirts of town. Her clothing was discovered in at least two separate locations prior to Linda's murder, or at least her disappearance. So this is a solved case? It is a solved case. And who was the killer? Her killer was David. And when was he arrested? He was arrested 1970. Before Linda White's remains were recovered, Comparing Soroy O'Connell case and this earlier case, there are overwhelming commonalities to Linda White. Not only MO, but also signature. This is what you're going to do next. I need you to plot each of these significant cases separately. See if you can come up with a probable home base for the killer. Renee, see if you can obtain the autopsy reports for the murder of and the 1970 murder of Soroy O'Connell. Daniel, we need to learn more about this octogenarian kidnapper, and where he was in November 1968. Without putting too much pressure on you, don't drop the ball now. Every once in a while, a case comes along that uh, reminds you just how disturbed the world can be and jars you. I mean, to me, this is a case that, uh, you know, thankfully, you don't see a lot of. able to get to both autopsy reports? Just one. I was not able to obtain the autopsy report in the unsolved murder of Saray O'Connell. However, I was able to acquire both the autopsy report and trial transcripts related to the conviction of David in the murder of What does it reveal? The soft tissue all along the length of her left arm is missing, and there are small teeth marks at both ends of that defect. And I cannot think of any scavenger that would only take the soft tissue down to the bone in such a limited area. Even more unusual, the left ear is completely absent. The perpetrator drove back to a shed that he was renting, which is near where the victim was picked up. Right. When the police went back to try and find the shed, it had been torn down, but the debris of that was all buried in a farmer's field. They searched the field and recovered several items. The documents indicate clothes, including an old jacket and other unspecified items were found in the dump and sent to the crime lab for testing. But the documents don't say whether those items could be tied specifically to either the killer or the victim. The fixation on the arm in particular takes us to Linda's case. And the amputation of the ear also takes us to Linda's case, where we see a combination possibly of both. 
There are some very clear similarities between the victims being transported from where they were initially picked up to being left exposed on the surface in a wooded area, missing body parts being deliberately removed. It's yeah. quite striking. This is literally the missing link between Linda's case and not only this murder in 1960, but I think numerous other cases. I'm going to take these findings forward to uh, an outside expert to verify. I'm about to speak with one of my mentors in this field, Dr. Eric Hickey. For my money, the world authority on necrophilia, which is murdering victims in order to procure uh, or obtain a body for various purposes. What stands out to you in terms of consistencies between the 60s, the 68, and the 70 cases? To recap, teenagers, surface burials, very well concealed. What you've talked about, the surface burials, the clothing scattered, there's all those things are, you know, to me, would suggest that you're probably looking at the same person. Dr. Hickey is also a recognized expert in similar act evidence, or the ability to connect crimes based on signatures and connect victims to single killers, specifically serial killers. Given also that there are not a lot of necrophiles who are out there killing their victims and doing this to them, I would look at it as a series and make the assumption that it's a series until I can prove otherwise. Dr. Hickey is convinced that these three cases are related based simply on the circumstances as I've provided them to him. He believes these crimes are part of a series with a single offender. Thanks again, Eric. With this spate of sexual homicides in the late 60s in London and area, it seems to me now, years later, we're dealing with a common signature. No question, we're dealing with a psychopathic serial killer. Tremendous progress has been made in the case of Linda White. The squad and I have discovered more new information in this 45-year-old mystery than I had ever hoped. There are still some loose ends, but I'm confident that we can put the pieces together and we'll have something substantial to present to the police and to Linda's family. Monty, you made some headway when it comes to the final known hours of Linda's life back in London. Just 100 meters north of where she was dropped off, there is a woman with the same last name as her tutor. I tracked this woman till 2001, and she's possibly passed by now. That's kind of where the trail ends. This could explain why Linda wanted to be dropped off there. But at this point, we don't know if her killer abducted her from that street or from somewhere else. We don't know yet. Renee? My analysis suggests that Linda's body was moved to the location where it was found one to two years prior to it being discovered. It's Roy O'Connell, 1970. She's discovered four years later, also very well secluded. And the pathologist in that case suggests that she'd only been there for one or two years as well. And we know that in the earlier murder, her body was discovered just by chance, only a month after she was kidnapped and murdered. Maybe her killer had plans to move her body too. What well, might account for that? We're looking for a perpetrator who would have kept the victims close to them, either alive or dead, for several years prior to disposing of the bodies. Dania, what have you discovered about this 80-something-year-old who was charged last year with attempted kidnapping and assault? His case is currently before the courts, and the alleged perpetrator is being held in custody. There is a publication ban, but I discovered that the man has a history of sexual assault dating back to the 1990s. Geographically, however, it's about 250 kilometers from London, but I think it's very important to include this into our report. That narrows down our list significantly. We're left with just one other person to further examine in the murder of Linda White. Peter, that's where you come in. Iran Rosmo's formula on Linda White and Soraya O'Connell. Rosmo's formula is a mathematical equation designed to find the most likely residence of a serial killer based on his crimes. If we assume that one serial killer was responsible for multiple kills, then we can pool these locations and more accurately come up with a, an estimate of where the serial killer lives. Rosmo's formula identified two equally likely offender residences from these three cases. Ingersoll, highlighted by the red region here on the map, and Kitchener at the upper right of this map. Finally, the mean center of all these cases lands right on the town of Ontario. This is precisely where 
the man convicted for the 1960s murder kept a woodshed where he walled up the souvenirs he took from that crime scene, a crime that bears remarkable similarities, not only to Linda White, but to Soroy O'Connell. I mean, this is amazing to see this at work. That cannot be dismissed as a coincidence. In six weeks, we have effectively reopened this case on our own. This is stunning, and thank you. I'm just so confident that, uh, that the police are going to reopen the case. When we were first uh, assigned this case, I thought, boy, are we ever in for it. You just never know, do you? The squad can take this case no further, and the police have received our research and analysis. The night Linda disappeared, a new lead is suggesting she did not hitchhike home from the exam. In fact, she was driven by a acquaintance, a classmate. It opens up a realm of possibilities in terms of what happened that night. So that brings us to the next question, which is, which is more likely, that this is someone known to her, an acquaintance, a classmate, a friend even, or a stranger? We're looking at a significant distance from where Linda was last dropped off to where she was found. The longer the distance driven, the greater or the more elaborate the attempts to conceal remains, the more it indicates a stranger on stranger attack. We start looking at similar cases, girls of Linda's age, and looking at 60 years worth of cases. There are at least two other cases involving London and area girls who were driven considerable distances and who were found in remote isolated locations, not unlike how and where Linda was found. The link here is a man convicted in the slaying of This man was never questioned about Linda's case. He was never questioned about the other two cases. This is the man whose name we are going to be putting forward to the police. A man named David This guy that you suspect is still alive? He's been paroled for the, for the 1960 murder and is still alive. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Well, there's no wonder that so little was accomplished in 45 years when we have been operating all these, this time that her last spot seen was at the college. And when her remains were found, that she was alive when she got there. And now it's no. neither one of those things seem to be what really happened. It's amazing what you found in six weeks. Mm -hmm. Now that you've heard that the likelihood is more that it was a stranger, how do you feel about well, that? It makes things better. That gives me some comfort in that uh, it's likely she wasn't betrayed by a friend. Looks good on you guys. Done a fabulous job. Yeah. Thanks, Ron. Good job. Well, well done. Thank you.